Well, welcome to everybody listening this evening. Uh, this is our first Monitor Farm Monday webinar, which is focusing on the topic of preparing for zero carbon farming. My name is Paul Hill and I represent the Agricultural and Horticultural Development Board in the South East as our Arable Knowledge Exchange Manager. I will be hosting proceedings over the next hour, also assisted by our in-house technical expert, even though he won't want to admit it, Christine Goodhill, who is who will be working behind the scene in order to ensure that the technology you are logging into today keeps ticking along as it hopefully should. Next slide, please. Um, I have a few uh, housekeeping things that I need to go through, so please just bear with me um, before we start and we get to our technical speakers. Um, firstly, you will see that your camera and mics are automatically turned off. This isn't a sign that we don't want your interaction during this meeting, far from it. Um, instead, we ask, uh, ask you to raise questions and thoughts um, by using the conversation stroke comment, comments icon um, that you should see towards the upper top right of your screen. Uh, by clicking this icon, uh, this icon, a box should appear on the right of your screen and at the bottom of it, you should be able to type and submit your questions and thoughts. Then by clicking on the send button, uh, to the right of this box, you can send these through to myself. I will certainly do my best to put as many of your questions to the panel within the time we have, but obviously this is somewhat this somewhat depends on uh, how many questions we receive uh, and also the time that uh, we have uh, for this webinar. As you can see from the clock, this meeting is due to last around an hour, finishing at approximately 8 p.m. However, um, I know I probably have a tall order to actually get through everything by then, so I'll do my utmost to keep things as close uh, to the planned end time as possible, but uh, we may run slightly over. There is uh, one Neuroso point available, and we expect similar with regards to basis, um, which is still to be confirmed, but uh, we think that's going to be coming. Therefore, anyone wishing to claim for these points, please send through your name, relevant number, re relevant member number, date of birth, postcode, um, using the conversation icon as already mentioned, and we will fill the form on your behalf and submit accordingly. So. Um, you are aware, so you, so you are aware, this meeting will be recorded um, and placed on the AHDB website and YouTube probably as well. So you can recap on any of the points raised or slides shown. Everyone attending today will be sent a link to this recording, so you should get that and you should be able to go back and relook at revisit things. Um, Next, finally, please feel free to tweet about anything you feel of interest at this meeting, and you can do so using the AHDB link shown on the screen and or utilising your own account. Hopefully it's all positive. Next slide. Yeah, thanks very much, Christian. You've got it up there. Um, so going quickly onto the agenda for today, you can see the general format of the meeting. I'm not going to go talk through this, but while you're looking at it, I just need to point out that while you're looking at this agenda, I should mention there are uh, in order about 56 carbon calculators available. However, the data you will see at this evening's meeting is from the Farm Carbon Cut and Toolkit. However, I must point out that the AHDB does not endorse one carbon tool over another, as the choice is very much down to your farming regimes and the suitability of the data they present. Next slide, please, Christian. So what's the, this meeting all about today? Well, as you all probably know, Parliament passed legislation requiring the government to reduce UK net greenhouse gas emissions by 100% by 2050. Meanwhile, the NFU has now set a goal of reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions across the whole of the across the whole of agriculture in England and Wales by 2040. I think Scotland is is 2045. I should point out that this is net zero. I think it is important to highlight that as it's not gross, as it is expected, as it is accepted that not all emissions can be reduced to zero, but instead these emissions potentially can be offset through other natural carbon sinks. 
We also need to remember that managing our farm carbon footprint is very much linked to the government clean air strategy, which integrates into the, the government 25 year strategy to develop a healthier and more sustainable environment, which includes mitigating the air pollution associated uh, with our farming operations. Therefore, whether we like it or not, these objectives will certainly have some influence on the way we farm in the coming years. But can we turn these challenges into opportunities that help us increase business efficiency and economic prosperity? So this meeting is a chance for you to investigate whether the information a carbon audit highlights can be val a valuable asset, asset to the future sustainability of your farming business. Next slide. Before I invite Becky to take uh, take, stay, take the stage, we would like to get your interaction by undertaking a poll. As you can see, it's nothing to do with Trump v Biden, as this would be a meeting in itself. Instead, we have two questions. Um, the first one you can see up there, um, it was very much geared to farmers. If you could just answer yes or no, have you completed or in the process of completing a carbon audit for your business? If you'd like to just uh, mark yes or no, um, if, that would be great. We'll leave it for sort, of, sort of 10 seconds. Okay, Christian. So 67% 67 of you haven't and 33% uh, of you have. So hopefully by the end of this meeting, that might have changed the other way, uh, the other way round, I would hope. The second question is very much geared to all of you out there um, to answer. Uh, do you think undertaking a carbon audit will assist, farm and uh, will assist farming businesses in being more efficient and economically sustainable? So if you'd like to vote on that one, please. Five more seconds. Okay, Christian. 72% of you, yeah, uh, say yes. 8% um, of you say no, and I don't know, 20%. So there is a, a big uh, in favour of, it does have some be other benefits doing a carbon audit. Uh, hopefully we will uh, be able to increase that by the end. So moving on, um, thank you for uh, your thoughts. They're really interesting to see that. It helps us sort of gauge things at the beginning. I'm hoping that uh, we can now whiz through. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Becky Wilson, who is the project officer for the Farm Carbon Cutting Toolkit. Becky is also a NUFL scholar, which she did in 2017 on the very apt topic covering communicating carbon reduction schemes to farmers, busting preconceptions, driving efficiency and profit. So Becky, I'm really pleased you can join us this evening in order to lead us through the reasons to do a carbon audit. Thank you ever so much for having me here this evening. It's really exciting to be here to talk about this topic of carbon footprinting and how we can use carbon footprinting as a tool to really demonstrate and document where we are now in terms of the performance of our business and how we can use it to look at what the future strategies might be in terms of able our ability to be able to reduce emissions and improve sequestration. Thank you very much. So my name's Becky Wilson and I'm project manager at the Farm Carbon Toolkit. Now the Farm Carbon Toolkit has been around since 2009 and its primary aim is to really provide practical help, tools and resources to farmers and growers to understand how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, how to improve soil health, how to uh, you know, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also improve business resilience. I suppose our uniqueness is that we are by farmers for farmers. So all of the directors of the organisation are full time farmers and then I'm uh, involved with the day to day running of the organisation. But the real aim, as I say, is to try and help farmers understand what they can do differently and the impact of those change in management with the whole area of carbon, climate and greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. So if we start there with that topic of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, there's been a lot of focus on it over the last 12 to 18 months. You take coronavirus out of it, which is taking everyone's attention at the moment. And we can see here that although all of the discussion and all of the language and communication around this topic is very much focused on carbon, for us as an industry, carbon is only a very small proportion of our emissions. 
We have three main gases which take up most of the emissions coming from agriculture, and those are carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and methane. And agriculture as an industry makes up about 10% of UK PLC's emissions. And you might say that for that 10%, we're getting 90% of the attention at the moment, but we are as an industry only contributing 10%. And as you can see from that pie chart there, only 10% of that 10% is coming from carbon dioxide. The two gases that we really need to focus our attention on are what's going on with methane and nitrous oxide. However, here we're provided with a really good positive in the fact that carbon management, managing carbon on the farm, is really, really closely related to business efficiency. So there are lots of things that we can do that will reduce our carbon footprint and also reduce our cost base, thus allowing our business to become more resilient. However, it's also important to remember at this time that there isn't one magic solution that will work on all farms. Each of your farms are a unique combination of what's under the soil, what falls out of the sky and what you do in the middle. Therefore, we need to take that uniqueness and work with the research and work together to deliver targeted solutions that work across the diversity of farming systems and landscapes that we have here in the UK. It's also really important to remember that we're not just producing these emissions for the sake of producing these emissions, we're producing these emissions because we're producing food. And that's really important. They can be difficult to measure because we've got to deal with the complex interplay between three gases and they're dependent on the weather. Agriculture exists in a biological system that includes lots of different nutrient cycles. So there is a lot of sort of leakage that happens in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, irrespective of what we do on top of it. So undaunted by all this complexity, we will continue. Thank you, next slide. So where do these three gases come from? So nitrous oxide, which is a real headache for us in terms of agriculture, because nitrous oxide is very much more potent in terms of its global warming potential than carbon dioxide is. And 80% of nitrous oxide emissions are coming from agriculture. As you can see from those images here, most of the emissions associated with nitrous oxide are around soil management, fertilizer and nutrients. So how we can manage, store and apply our manures, our fertilizers, and how we can maintain our soil in really good structure, all will have an impact on how much nitrous oxide our businesses are producing. If we look in the middle there with methane, the majority of methane is coming from our ruminant animals. However, it's also coming from how we manage, store and apply our manures. And that, that applies to not just ruminants, but also the manures that are coming from our monogastric systems as well. And again, lots of opportunities to reduce our methane intensity by looking at trying to deliver profitable livestock systems that are being very efficient. And then we have carbon, which, as I say, is the main issue for a lot of other industries. And we produce carbon emissions in the same way as some other industries in terms of burning of fossil fuels and how we can use those in terms of our fuel use and electricity use on the farm. However, here we also have agriculture's unique ability in terms of our ability to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and hold it on farm. And that allows agriculture to actually be one of the climate solutions. And that's something that we really need to focus on. Although we are producing a lot of emissions, although, as I say, we're intrinsically linked with food production, we also are in the enviable position as an industry to be able to provide a solution. Thank you. Um, so this is just showing basically that um, Agriculture is the green line there and that you can see that actually, although we were doing quite well in terms of reducing emissions since about sort of 2010, we haven't really reduced emissions by any by any more than what we were. So we're sort of fairly static. And that's one of the reasons why um, there's been quite a lot of attention on us as an industry. As other industries have managed to decarbonize, our efforts have sort of fairly flatlined. Um, and as I say, so there's more attention on why, why has this happened? Thank you. Next slide. So if we have a quick look in terms of why should we manage carbon on farm, looking at the bigger picture, and I'm sure these are some of the things that John has been talking about. But we, as I say, as he said, we have national targets to reduce carbon emissions from agriculture. Um, I say we started with the Climate Change Act, which made us reduce our emissions by at least 80% by 2050. That's now been superseded by the new net zero legislation, which means that that 80% reduction isn't enough anymore. We need to be down at sort of 100% reduction. We also signed up to the Paris Climate Accord, so we have international targets. And all of this means that we have an increasing attention on agriculture and our, our efforts as an industry to start to reduce our emissions and look at opportunities for sequestration. Thank you. So that's the bigger picture stuff. But if we look at why should we manage carbon on farm at a farm level, 
I'll repeat my earlier point. It makes business sense. There's this really good relationship between reduced costs, improved efficiencies and reduced carbon footprint, which is really, really good. It also allows us to be more informed and make better decisions. So actually, if we've got an understanding of what our carbon footprint is now, it allows us to appreciate the size of our individual challenge at a, as a farm to reach net zero. But it also allows us to make decisions. So when we're looking at those things that we might want to change on the farm, we can look at them also with a carbon lens on it as well. It's just another lens for looking at business efficiency. It enables a positive narrative and our industry really needs a positive narrative at the moment. And actually by providing data and giving you guys the evidence in terms of what's happening, it then allows you to start to change that narrative with our consumers. It creates more resilient businesses. And as John said, it future proofs us. Thank you. So this all starts with really the process of carbon footprinting and this old adage that you can't manage what you don't measure. Thank you, next slide. And put very, very simply, all a carbon footprint is, is it allows you to identify the amount and the source of those three different gases, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide that are emitted from the farm and then highlights areas where you might make improvements or changes to reduce your emissions. And that identification of that carbon footprint is the first step in being able to understand the contribution of your farm to climate change. It allows you to become more aware and make informed decisions, as I've already said, but those metrics that you use need to be relevant. So they need to make sense to your business. They need to be practical. So they need to be asking you questions that are important, consistent, and then inform behavioral change. Thank you. And quite often what happens is that actually you get very, very focused on the data collection because it can be really clunky and it can be a real pain in the backside and actually miss the opportunity to say, well, what's that footprint telling me in terms of what I, where I am now and what I can do about it? We have another issue with carbon in the fact that it's really, really difficult to contextualise um, in the fact that carbon footprints, although they're very, very useful in terms of both environmental and economic accounting, we can't see emissions disappearing from our business. We can't see methane, we can't see nitrous oxide you know, being emitted. So it makes it really difficult to be able to understand what it is and visualise it. If I asked you guys to visualise what a tonne of carbon dioxide would look like or how much volume that would take up, it can be really difficult. So actually, if we manage to do a carbon footprint and contextualize it, we can start to understand what the differences are between different commodities that we have on the farm. Thank you, next slide. So our carbon calculator, as I said, there's lots of them available and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but obviously this is the calculator that we've used to look at these two farm examples and Andy and Rob have been fantastic at um, being really open and honest and allowing us to look at look at what this means. Um, I say it sort of follows our USP of being by farmers for farmers, um, but I'm not going to focus on that too much. So if we can move on. Thank you. As I said a minute ago, there's different steps. So you need to sort of choose your tool, gather your data, um, enter that data into the tool and then look at the results and then look at what that what that means for you. And actually, if you can move on to the next slide, Christian, a lot of, often the focus is on that first bit in terms of that data collection bit. That's the really boring bit. It is really boring, even for saddos like me that do this all day long. That is the bit that can be clunky. It can be a pain in the neck and it can make you want to pick up the computer and throw it out the window. But actually, that's the sort of process. And that's what you need to get through in order to get to the really exciting bit in terms of getting a result. Like you can see there, a result of minus 815 tonnes. Fantastic. But actually, until, unless we go through that process, we don't get to that. And then the really important bit, which is what do these figures mean and what can I do about them? Thank you. Next slide. And that's really where we're going to focus now. So interpreting results is a key part of the process. And that's what we're going to chat with our two fantastic farmers now. Um, it really allows you, to, it allows you to be able to evaluate your current position and look at what your strategy is for reducing emissions and improving sequestration for the future. It gives you that baseline. It puts a line in the sand in terms of this is where we are now. Um, you know, it allows you to sort of understand your current position, allows you to be more informed and then gives you the evidence to change management. Thank you, um, Paul. That should hopefully segue into the next section. Brilliant. Thank you, Becky, for going. you can still hear me. <laughs> yeah, very well. Thank you. I'm glad you're back with us. Welcome back and thank you for that. Um, just before we get on to the next bit, which does involve you, Becky, Becky I want to now introduce both our farmers, as you've uh, just mentioned, um, and just for them to briefly give us a bit of a background to their farming businesses. So, Rob, uh, welcome uh, this evening. Uh, do you want to just begin and just give us that background? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, so Rob Waterston, uh, I'm the farm manager for the Wealth of Estate Partnership uh, in Newbury and Berkshire. Uh, the estate, just a little bit of a thousand hectares. Um, we straddled the M4. Um, 
just to the west of Newbury in Berkshire. Got a, a real mixed bag of soil types, um, some quite easy ground, some, some tougher ground. Um, we, a few years ago, we sort of sat down and decided that we need to look at our, or reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we wanted to improve uh, water and nutrient efficiency uh, and reduce soil erosion. We've got the River Lambourne running through the estate, which is a very valuable chalk stream. So we were conscious to look after that. And we wanted to reduce our reliance on uh, pesticides and, and fertilizer. So this also led us to looking at our soils, improving them and getting the biology working. So we looked at that and um, 2016, we lost the battle with black, black grass. We'd been growing a real sort of uh, barley, rape, wheat rotation, and yeah, got into all sorts of trouble. So we looked at sort of changing a few things. Um, and cover crops were introduced and went moved and moved to spring cropping, um, <clears throat> which was a real change for us. Um, we then we've also got uh, we looked at our drilling systems and decided to go down the strip till route with the help of some leader funding and um, that worked as it's, it's working it's still going we've also bought a second drill uh, looking at a direct system so um, we've now got the choice to make uh, you know which drill we use in which circumstances our soils are improving we've been um, measuring uh, organic matter over the several years now so we've got some good data to feed into this calculator which has been quite interesting we've also got 185 hectares of uh, woodland which has been which is quite useful uh, in terms of this this toolkit um, and we've got two two countryside stewardship arrangements running on the farm so yeah that's a bit of a sort of an overview and Probably just one little thing. For the first time this 2019, we saw livestock on the arable sector, uh, which was a, a new experience. So, yeah, that's a bit of a snapshot of what we do at Welford. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. That's a great job. Um, and moving uh, swiftly on um, to Andy. Andy uh, Basson Farms near Winchester in Hampshire. So good evening, Andy. Um, do you want to give us a brief uh, description of your farming operations? Yeah, good evening, Paul. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm the farm manager at uh, Newhouse Farm near Winchester. 800 hectares of owned land. It's family owned. Uh, family live on the farm. We crop uh, 600 hectares of that 800. Um, pretty uh, usual sort of rotation wheat, barley, rape, uh, and beans as well. Got some linseed this year and also some uh, canary seed as a first for us. All of our grain uh, goes into Hampshire grain or Trinity grain as it is now. Um, so we've got no on farm storage at all, only um, temporary uh, buffer storage. Um, we've got a small um, small flock of sheep, small herd of pigs, um, and all the meat from or pretty much all the meat from those from those animals gets sold direct to the public uh, via a box scheme that we that we run, which is uh, it is very popular. Um, other things going on, we've got two biomass boilers on the farm, or three actually, two that run wood chips uh, and uh, one that's, uh, that runs on um, hazel coppice from the farm. So all the, everything that goes into those boilers is produced or comes from the farm and we, we harvest that ourselves and then get it chipped and utilise that in, in those boilers. Um, and that's been going on for about four years now. Uh, we also have a small family shoot on the farm um, as well, which we, we look after. Um, and so that sort of takes in some of the um, some of the woodland, obviously, as well, and um, various bits of game cover and, and, and stewardship margins as well. So uh, there's quite a lot going on here. And um, yeah, that's about it, Paul, I think. 
That's brilliant. Thanks, Andy. That gives us a good insight. And what I should point out that both these farmers, you can uh, gain more information about them on the web because they both, uh, Rob is our new 2020 monitor farmer in the southeast. Andy Basson has been a monitor farmer and now he's um, on the journey with LEAF on the Resilient and Ready program. So uh, there's details on the website at various websites that you can pick up on that. Um, so moving on, guys, uh, just before Becky, I bring Becky back in um, you've both done you've both uh, used the audit um, from the carbon cutting toolkit how did you find it um, and what did you learn from the information Rob can I come to you first yeah um, on the whole it's, it wasn't too bad some of it's a bit clunky like Becky said earlier um, but no surprise I wasn't you know, no surprise with the, the big offenders you know nitrogen fertilizers um pretty you know it was a big a big hit but what i hadn't really uh, appreciated is the value of um where we've improved organic matter levels i really had hadn't realized quite what that how good that can be in terms of of carbon so um that for me was a real eye opener um i do wonder whether it's fair to include all our woodland if we're going to be really pedantic about you know whether we should strip the woodland out and treat that as a separate unit we do see the woodland here as a crop so we are harvesting timber uh, restocking the family are very keen to plant new woodlands but if we're going to be you know really honest about our actual physical farming operation should we um should we you know strip the woodland out you know, we're lucky enough to have you know a big quite a considerable area of woodland but yeah, on, on the whole, it's been a really good, uh, you know, an interesting process. And it certainly, as our previous speakers have said, it does, it just makes you aware of what, you, what you're doing, where you are, and it's like a, like a benchmark. So um, yeah, for me, it's been a good, a good exercise. Brilliant. And, and Christian, I don't know whether you just want to move on a slide because I think we've got um, the, not from you, House, the next slide on. I think we've got um, the, page that's it on the uh, for, on the results of uh, Rob's carbon audit where he stands um, so Andy uh, we'll move on a slide as well as to look at your carbon audit results but uh, do you want to just answer those two questions um, with regard to how you found it and what did you learn yeah sure the um, the process itself uh, as has been said it was I say daunting that's probably too strong a word it was it was quite Comfy, quite a good word actually. You know, getting that data together was was quite time consuming. And when, but once you had that, it was then um, reasonably easy to, to to input that into the system. And actually, um, you know, once you've done that, you can tweak it and, and fine tune it as you go, as as, as required. Um, uh, probably not something I would have done actually. Um, sort of at this stage in in in. In, in the sort of my farming journey, if you like, I mean, I was encouraged to do it by Leaf as part of their program, but actually, I'm glad I have done it. Um, and as been said more than once this evening, it's, it is a line in the sand. It is, you know, a snapshot of how you're doing now, um, and something we can use going forward. So, I mean, going forwards, we've got um, about 10 hectares of, of new woodland which we're going to plant here at Newhouse Farm, um, and also uh, a small agroforestry. Um, um, scheme we're going to run as well so it'll be interesting sort of over the coming years to do this you know again and again and sort of see what effects if any that, that these two new schemes are having on our on our carbon footprint Brilliant. Thanks, both of you. I'm, I'm just aware because we've got lots of questions coming in and they do involve both of you, but I'm keen now to get Becky back involved just before we get to questions, just to go, get now into the nitty gritty of uh, your carbon audits. So, Becky, I know you've gone through various elements of Rob and Andy's carbon audit and pulled together some interesting data uh, based on their audit. So over to you, uh, please. Thank you very much. And um, I say it's great. It's great to hear your um both of your experiences of it and you haven't as I say wanted to either sort of uh, you know never do it again and run away run away and never come back to it which is good because I say it can be quite a daunting process starting but what what hopefully this next section is going to very very quickly explain is that actually the pain and the and the sort of um, you know data collection that is needed can be worth it because the really exciting bit and it is really exciting is then so what 
So what does this mean? And what of, what often happens is we get to this figure and then you say, so is that good? Is that bad? You know, what? how does this compare to others? And actually, so the interpretation of carbon footprinting is so important. Next slide, please. So you can see these two farms here, but what are you comparing it to? And this brings us up a big question in the fact that those first, that first where you could see their headline results in that previous slide, we had no idea of the size of the farm and obviously Rob and Andy have both told us that. But actually, if you're comparing two farms just on that headline balance, it's very, very difficult because as I say, they could be vastly different in sizes. So you can see there that blue graph, which is showing a total carbon balance for a range of farms, which is similar in type to both Rob and Andy's farm. And you can see there's a vast mix there. But what you can do, which makes it slightly more, slightly more sort of relevant, is if you put it down in terms of a carbon balance per hectare. So you take that overall figure in terms of emissions minus sequestration, and then you divide it by the number of hectares. And that allows you to have something which is slightly easier in terms of that benchmarking process. You can see there that it's still a big range, and you can see that the two farms that we're working with here, both their bars are going down, which is a good thing. Again, here we get to one of the issues in terms of how we communicate about carbon. If it's got a negative number in front of it, it's a good thing. Unlike bank accounts and financial accounting, negative is a good thing because it means you're carbon positive. So again, those bars going down means that they're doing out of this sort of, uh, you know, breakdown of a few different farms. You can see that they're both doing really well. Next slide, please. But what does it actually mean? And this is where we then take those numbers and we say, well, how can we then use that to see, well, what can I do differently? Rather than just being a, OK, that's great. I've done it. You know, I've got my figure. Therefore, we should put it on the put it on the mantelpiece and it will stay there until we do it again. How can we actually use this to really start to kickstart discussions about what we can do differently? A bit like Andy just said, how can we start to look at modelling things that we're doing differently? Or as Rob said, you know, starting to really be able to take account of some of those changes that have happened over the last few years in his business. And also, it's really important to look at where are those areas which can also save money as well as carbon and really focus on doing those first, because that helps in terms of building resilience. What are those short term quick wins? What can you potentially do over the more longer term? And this tool, so this carbon calculator can be used to scenario plan. So you can model different options. And you, once you've put your data in once, you can copy that data and you can play around to your heart's content. You can create as many different versions of it as you like, which can look at those different things. Next slide, please. So. In terms of how carbon footprinting works, we take all of the emissions that come from those different categories. So the main categories around fuels, materials, inputs, so that's fertilizers and uh, crop protection materials, cropping, livestock and waste. We take away the sequestration that's happening either in our trees, our hedgerows, any non-cropped areas, so areas that are in stewardships or those sort of things, um, soil carbon. We also include offsets. So if you're producing any renewable energy on farm, if you're recycling any waste, that's classed as an offset and that goes in there. And then, as I said, it's a very simple, uh, very simple sum in terms of one minus the other, which gives our carbon balance. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of where we're focusing on, on the emission side, we're looking to try and reduce those as much as possible by looking at changing management. And then we're also looking to try and improve the amount of sequestration that's happening or looking at areas for other offsetting. Thank you. So if we look at those two categories, so we've looked at those headline figures, but actually it's really important to delve down into a bit more detail. And in terms of being able to benchmark these two farms against each other, you can see here we've got a couple of anomalies in the fact that, as Rob said when he was going through, um, he was in, surprised about the levels of carbon sequestration. And those areas that we'll look at in a minute in terms of sequestration are where that soil organic matter around soil carbon have built up. But you can see it here also the other side of that in terms of if you are losing soil organic matter, then that's then provided as an emission. So you can see that top column there, which is around land use, is emissions that are associated from some of the fields on Rob's farm where we've lost soil organic matter. So although it's a fantastic opportunity, once we've sequestered that carbon, we also have to try our hardest to keep hold of it rather than letting it be emitted again. And we can also see on Andy's farm that he's, as he's already mentioned, has got livestock. So there are two categories that actually we can't compare across. So if we do a little bit of adjustment and take those out, you'll see in the next category, in the next, um, the next slide, you can see that actually it's a little bit more representative in terms terms of those uh, being able to benchmark across those different figures. The thing to look at here is really the percentage, the percentage of emissions that are coming from each of those broad categories. And we can see here that fuels is between sort of 12 and 13 percent. But the two biggies, as I think both uh, Andy and Rob said at the beginning, are really around fertilisers um, and also around emissions to do with crops. So that's emissions associated with growing those crops uh, in terms of crop residue management and all that sort of thing. And these are really the areas where you can then start to say, well, these are where we can focus. Materials and inventory tend to be quite small. 
And again, fuel tends to be on an average arable farm is around 10%. So again, something to look at in terms of fuel use efficiency. Thank you. So if we just focus on those three main categories really to look at, in terms of fuel emissions, you can see that from both farms, the vast majority of fuel emissions, as is, unexpe as is expected, is coming from red diesel use. And then you can start to look at comparing, you know, the fuel emissions per hectare, which again are broadly similar, because then you can start to take into account, uh, you know, the sort of the, the area of the farm. This is really, really common on a lot of arable farms. Diesel usage is the main one. And again, there's lots of opportunities to start to look to reducing that. Next slide, please. In terms of some of those strategies that we might need to look at for reducing fuel use, these are the really boring ones, but they can make a difference. And especially if we start to look at in terms of increased resilience and reduction in costs, all these things are really, really important. And I say, if we can use machinery more efficiently, we can reduce fuel use by between 10 to 20 percent. We've got farms that we've worked with that have managed to cut their diesel usage by up to 20 percent and have also saved a huge amount in terms of costs. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm whipping through these quite quickly. Um, if we look at crop emissions, again, the majority of those on both farms is coming from, you know, the, the main the main crops that are being grown, both in terms of, uh, you know, wheat providing a lot of it there. But also you'll see here that um, you can get there's some uh, emissions that are coming from green manures or cover crops that are being used. When we take account of those emissions from cover crops, we're taking account of the leguminous part of that cover crop because that's also producing some nitrous oxide emissions when that cover crop is uh, incorporated or destroyed. That's obviously the breakdown of those legumes is providing a nitrous oxide emission. Mission. So again, when you're putting that in, you might find that it's just, you might sort of question why it's just the leguminous species that are there. That's why it is, because they're producing an emission there. Next slide, please. In terms of inputs, as again, this is a big one, uh, over half of emissions for both of these farms. Um, if we look at nitrogen use per hectare, um, we can see that there's a little bit of a difference um, between Rob and Andy in terms of that. Um, but actually the figures themselves are, are fairly similar. So again, looking at it, an area-based solution is quite useful. Um, you can see here in terms of, uh, you know, the sort of range of different products that you can include in there. You'll also see, for those of you that have got very good eyesight, um, that, you know, the differences between emissions associated with nitrogen, which is, you know, the big baddie in terms of emissions, and then emissions associated with crop protection products, which is very, very small on their carbon terms. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, and again, lots of opportunities in terms of improving both fertiliser and manure management in terms of looking at good soil structure, uh, in terms of looking at nutrient management planning, fertiliser management, and then also looking at considering things like inhibitors or abatement. Next slide, please. Now, let's move on to the sequestration or the good bit. And you'll see that actually for both of these farms, they're doing a huge amount in terms of sequestration. Rob mentioned at the beginning that he has that area of woodland and you can see there that that woodland is accounting for about 33% of, uh, of his sequestration value. Interestingly, if you if you did, you know, so Rob, we could model in terms of if you took out that woodland, what would happen? You'd still, you'd still just about be coming out in terms of, uh, in terms of carbon positive uh, if you took that woodland out, although I would say it'd be, be slightly lower. Um, but you still would be net positive, which is great. You can also see in there some hedgerows um, and then also that offset that I showed you at the beginning. Both of these farms are doing offsetting in, uh, offsetting in terms of recycling uh, their waste products, which provides them an offset here. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the different way that we measure sequestration, we have the ones that like hedgerows, which are measured by area and management. Um, so again, management can make a real difference. And Andy, I noticed on yours, obviously, you've got um, annual cutting of your hedgerows. If you manage to change that to every other year, you could actually improve the carbon content. You could double the carbon content of your hedgerow. So again, something which, if it's possible, you can do really, really easily and actually bumps up your sequestration quite nicely. Um, in terms of woodland, those can be entered in terms of detailed woodlands with areas and ages or just broad categories. Field margins or uncultivated areas, again, are put on an area basis, perennial crops, and then soil organic matter. Um, as I said earlier, there's also offsetting. And soil organic matter is used as a measurement-based approach, whereas all of the others are used as an area-based approach. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, that's the uh, figures there in terms of recycling. Both of them, uh, both of the farms here are managing to do a good amount and getting a, a decent offset um, just from recycling waste. Thank you. Next slide. 
Uh, in terms of non-soil sequestration, we can see there that obviously that woodland that's on Rob's is providing uh, quite a lot of that sequestration, um, but also some going on from some, some hedgerows and some infield trees. Um, and on Andy's farm, again, we can see we've still got a significant period proportion of woodland there, um, but also some going on from some other perennial cropping. Thank you. Next slide. Um, in terms of how we measure soil sequestration and how it's included in the calculator, um, I think both Rob and Andy uh, and Andy mentioned, in order to account for it within the calculator, you need to have two time points that you've got soil organic matter data. They don't have to be next to each other, so you don't have to do testing on an annual basis. It can be as Rob's is or as Andy's was, sort of 2015 and 2019, but you do need to have those two time points. And that's something that we're working to, uh, to ha help farmers with, because we understand that a lot of farmers don't have that information. Um, and so with the work we're doing with Soil Carbon Project will help this. But it's also really important to be able to differentiate between carbon stock so the carbon that we're holding in our soils as a result of historical land management and carbon sequestered, which is the additional carbon that's been pulled in that year, which can genuinely be used as an offset against your emissions for that calendar year that you're doing your footprint for. Next slide, please. Um, so if we look here in terms of the two farms, um, across the fields that have been logged in the calculator for Rob's, um, the maximum annual rate of sequestration, um, although the tests were done sort of in 2006, was it 16, Rob? 15, 16, I can't remember which one was which. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, 2016 we started, I think. Yeah. That's right, 2016 and, and recently, the maximal, maximum annual rate on one of the fields was 0.43% a year, which is high, but the average across all the fields that have got that was 0.23. Um, so the total sequestration that was coming from soil, uh, organic matter on, on Rob's farm was just over 2,000 tonnes. On Andy's farm, we had to do a little bit of adjustment and jiggery pokery because of different uh, different labs and different analysis methods, which again, I'm happy to pick up in questions. Um, the maximum annual rate across the fields that we included was 0.34% and the average across all of the fields was 0.2% increase a year. So again, total soil sequestration of just over 1,500 tonnes. <coughs> It's also really important to remember, as I showed at the beginning, that you can lose as well as gain, and then it becomes an emission. So like we had with Rob's, uh, we had 921 tonnes from organic matter loss. So again, it's really important not just to look at how we can, how we can massively um, you know, increase sequestration. It's also about holding on to it when we've got it. Next slide, please. Um, and just a sort of quick one on testing advice coming from Soil Carbon Project, a really good sort of, uh, you know, saying in terms of the best time to start testing for these things was about 10 to 20 years ago. Next best time to start is, is now because it really does help in terms of data as we start to build up a picture of all this sort of stuff around carbon performance. It's really important, um, as we found with, with, with Andy, in terms of not having to do those adjustments uh, to try and really stick to the same lab, same time of year if you really want to supercharge it in terms of looking at GPS in your soil, part, your sample points and being really consistent in terms of the depth of sample. Because this information really does help us in terms of providing that evidence, but we've got to make sure that we do as good a job as possible in terms of taking those samples so that we can really make the most of what's coming off them. And it's really just echoed across the whole carbon footprinting process. If you put, you know, if you put good data in, you'll get good data out, um, and it is really worth, worth looking at that. Thank you, next slide. Becky, about a minute, because I'm just- Yep, that's fine, this is, my last, this is my last slide, yeah. so that was great. Okay. So yeah, just to, just to really finish off, and apologies, I know that's been a real gallop through it all. Um, in terms of using carbon calculators, they are a tool. They're a tool that can be used um, to help plan future management and baseline where you are currently. I think we've mentioned it a couple of times this evening about just providing that line in the sand. But it's also really important to remember that carbon, you know, carbon efficiency and carbon management it's just another lens to look at what you're doing and it hopefully just gives you a fresh pair of eyes to really start to evaluate what you're doing. It's really important to just understand the background to the one you are using, um, you know, making sure that you know what's included and what's not included. Find one that works for you. So what do you want the results? Do you want to start to have a sort of in-depth look at where, in what management practices are doing what, in which case use one um, a bit like ours that is quite in detail, or do you just want a sort of quick and easy overarching understanding, um, in which case potentially use another one? It's an evolving science. None of the carbon calculators are perfect. We haven't got there yet, but we've got to start somewhere. Um, and hopefully I think that's that's the end of it, um, Christian. Thank you. I think it should just be last slide. Um, and I'm just conscious as I say that I have um, I have galloped through that. So if anybody has wants to get in contact, there's my my details. 
but I'd just like to introduce John Foote in the meantime, who is the AHDB's Head of Environmental and Resource Management. Um, this is relatively a new team within AHDB with an important remit, which I'm sure John will discuss over the next five or, five or so minutes. So John, welcome and over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm hoping this is the right slide deck as well. So uh, can I have the next slide, please? <laughs> So what I'm going to talk about today covers a bit about uh, that Becky's covered, which is, you know, what is a greenhouse gas, the basic terminology, why we should measure greenhouse gases, uh, and what are the current barriers to really looking at uh, emission trading and offsetting in agriculture. And, and that's where the big opportunity that Becky has been talking about uh, lies in the future. Can I have the next slide, please? So maybe just to sort of build on what Becky was saying that, you know, we're all aware of you know greenhouse gases they're in the press uh, and we see it on a, a sort of regular basis at this time of year um, in terms of carbon dioxide and water vapor in particular um, trapping heat so on a you know clear night like tonight the temperature is dropping quite quickly and it feels a lot colder than when you've got a bit of cloud cover and that is just the greenhouse gas working now the the main thing is that greenhouse gases are uh, reported uh, from agriculture on a a 100 year basis so we talk about gwp which is the global warming potential and gwp 100 is the basis for accounting for the paris agreement and all other international obligations now a lot of you will have also heard about gwp star and it's it's generated a lot of interest and really that differs in that it sort of normalizes the period of time that that uh, methane in particular has its impact in the environment for 30 years and then it's it's thought that it breaks down into co2 and has a much less significant greenhouse gas than methane because methane is you know 21 to 28 times worse um, than uh, co2 its equivalent so we always talk about global warming potential in terms of you know, it's equivalence back to carbon dioxide. And then we have multipliers to show what gases uh, have a much bigger impact over that 100 years. Now, the problem is that the UK government have committed to achieve net zero uh, across all sectors, um, That, but it's doing so with the Paris Agreement using the GWP um, 100. Um, and therefore, that is the accountancy method that will be used at the moment. Can I have the next slide, please? And I'll, I'll explain where there are precedents set uh, for using alternative methods. So I recently came back to agriculture from the electricity industry, and you can see here that there are different scopes of emissions, and it's really just different accountancy buckets for the carbon. And scope two emissions, which are your electricity, uh, can be measured in terms of grid average, which is what everybody gets through the, the wires to the, to the house and the farm, or location, uh, sort of contractual um, emissions. And that may be that you've actually gone out and you've bought 100% renewable uh, electricity, or maybe you generate all your electricity on your farm and can claim the benefits of that. Now, under the uh, international reporting obligations, that scope to emission can be reported either as location, uh, i.e. grid average, or um, uh, what you've contracted for, but you have to drill report them. So I think in terms of GWP 100 and GWP star, if GWP star is ever acceptable, then you will end up having to drill report. So it doesn't necessarily help out in terms of emissions. This diagram is also useful because it shows that most of us on the farm will monitor our scope one, the direct emissions from the manures, the fertilizer, use in terms of uh, nitrous oxide, diesel that you burn in the tractor, and we can account for that relatively easy because we, 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 we have an invoice, we know roughly what is, we fed the cows, we can then apply emission factors. Same with the electricity. Where it becomes increasingly complicated, and I don't want to dwell on it too much tonight, is around the scope three emissions, where you have to look at, you know, what are the imported emissions associated with some of the products that you may use on the farm, um, the transport involved in moving that to you, and also potentially the way that customers might use your product or waste your product. And for example, Marks and Spencer some years ago uh, worked out their entire footprint and worked out that if you wash your clothes at 20 degrees rather than 40 degrees, 
you would eliminate most of the, the, the chunk of the carbon footprint. Becky also sort of focused on the three sort of uh, gases, CO2, methane and nitrous oxide. We shouldn't forget that, you know, we have a very small amount of uh, F gases. So that's uh, HFCs and PFCs in this diagram. And they're largely related to sort of uh, refrigeration. Uh, and that's, you know, particularly the issue with uh, dairy. If you've got leaking equipment, you're releasing some of the greenhouse gases. And some of these have an absolutely horrendous emission factor. So they can be 3,000, 4,000 times worse than CO2. So we shouldn't ignore those, but, um, you know, as you swap equipment out and renew chillers uh, and uh, refrigeration on the farm, you will see that that impact will come down with time. Can I have the next slide, please? So really, it's, it's quite important to understand what your, your scope of uh, emissions are on the farm. And it's not just talking about scope one, two and three, as in the previous diagram. But it's where you want to draw the boundaries and where you've got direct control, I would say, over what you can uh, sort of manage. You uh, ideally want to sort of identify why you, where you've got your hot spots and, and that'll be around your fertilizer use. Your, the, you know, if you've got livestock, the, the length of time the livestock are on the farm, what you're feeding them, how you deal with the manures. And, you know, it's worth bearing in mind that all of the products that you use on the farm the more expensive they generally are, the higher the amount of carbon in them, and also potentially the greater rewards associated with mitigating that carbon. So carbon is money, and, uh, and it is now. It's not just something that's conceptual for the future. So we believe strongly that if you have a, a good focus on key performance, and you can look at your financial performance, you will also see feeding through to your greenhouse gas emissions, environmental impacts in general, uh, a step change in performance. And we don't have to aim for a big bang. It can be, you know, very much like, uh, you know, cycling in the Olympics, you know, incremental improvements uh, that you make, but lots of them in terms of marginal gains that will, you know, improve your business. So whatever you're doing in terms of trying to improve the business will generally dr drive your, your uh, environmental performance as well. Now, it, it's worth, you know, understanding where you've got these hotspots or measuring such, you know, using the, a, a range of tools uh, and the one that Becky uh, uh, has produced is an ex excellent example. And I think the key thing is to start somewhere and don't worry about how accurate that tool is or how it compares to others. It's a case of choose a tool that works for you and use that tool consistently. Even if the answer is not 100% right, yeah, if you keep using that tool year in, year out, you will find that uh, the differences you measure between years will be uh, correct uh, and that you are then able to sort of take credit for that, that reduction. So use the tools to help you find where you can uh, identify your hotspots and then look at, um, you know, the risks uh, and opportunities that will drive those benefits on your farm uh, and, and use that to help you make some decisions. If you're not sure then that there is professional advice and guidance out there and it may be worth uh, you know engaging some additional support and this is something we're providing through the farm excellence platform which includes monitor and strategic farms uh, where we're going out to audit uh, the, the, the farms uh, and support the farmers with the information that comes out of the tools and then to work with the farmer to sort of develop a, a, an action plan to reduce carbon which they can then sort of follow through. And it's worth thinking about, well, why do I want to sort of measure greenhouse gas and report on that? And, and to be honest, at the moment, it's largely voluntary. Um, and, you know, your customers and NGOs and your peers uh, might want to know how you're doing. Um, but in the future, it will be uh, an increasing requirement of the supply chain. Uh, and it will support your ability to sell product. Uh, and, you know, I think also help export our product around the world. Uh, and that's where the opportunity is. I think now is a good time to start doing this work and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to report it. You can do a, a sort of gray exercise where you, you track the numbers internally and, and, and get comfortable with the approach and, and uh, you know, make sure that the numbers you've got are robust before you go out publicly. But eventually I think everybody's gonna end up having to do this uh, and it may become a barrier to sort of, uh, you know, supplying to the market. So. The opportunity now is to get it right uh, and uh, build it into your business. 
The other thing is we don't know at this stage what is likely to be in the, the environmental land management scheme ELMS. And uh, it was, for me, I would not want to take the risk of, you know, not having a baseline. So if you get to ELMS in a few years time and they say you must have three years data to, to claim the carbon credits, then if you haven't got that, you've, you've excluded yourself. And so I would say, you know, start early, build your confidence uh, and start uh, looking for the opportunities to improve business performance and profits for yourselves. Next slide, please. So what are the barriers for emission trading or offsetting in agriculture at the moment? Well, there are, you know, a lack of clear standards uh, for monitoring and reporting emissions. And that's not just, you know, on farm. We've got a range of tools and, and the, you know, if many of you have played with them, they can be inconsistent in terms of the numbers they spit out. But, you know, even at a national level, we don't have uh, uh, clear schemes and opportunities uh, for external business from uh, outside of the sector to invest in, in the market. When I was in the electricity sector, we could uh, invest in clean development mechanisms where we could put in uh, opportunities to invest in low carbon technologies in uh, countries abroad. And there were very strict standards around that. But we haven't got that equivalent here and we need to have those. Otherwise, uh, the, the risk is that the money will go abroad. So there is an opportunity now to sort of work on those standards and we're starting to do that and thinking at AHDB and working with DEFRA and other organisations to think about how that can work and how UK agriculture can benefit from that. But be under no illusion, there is a significant amount of carbon that UK PLC is going to have to offset. Um, and there is a massive opportunity for that money to flow into UK agriculture and for you know trees and other uh, sort of landscape type interventions to uh, be funded through that particular route. And in addition, we've got biodiversity net gain, which is another opportunity, uh, and we need to uh, make sure that's supported. So at the moment, there's a limited market for UK carbon credits. Uh, there's a pent up appetite there, I've got to say, and we would like to get that market up and running sooner rather than later. Uh, and we would want to ensure that companies are in a good place to take that up. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, as I mentioned, there are opportunities to sort of um, uh, both, you know, manage carbon and with the environmental land management system, there may be, you know, other opportunities to uh, get payments for providing public goods and services. And it's, it's, we're also thinking about what's the best way to ensure that, you know, farmers and growers get a fair return. And, you know, offsetting carbon doesn't come risk free. If you plant uh, some woods and the woods burn down, who's liable for that? And also, how would you be paid? Would you get one big lump sum of cash that's going to last you 30 years? Um, uh, and if that was me, I'd go on a great holiday and then be bankrupt thereafter. Or will there be money that comes in every year that pays for the, the, the opportunity? In addition, you know, what I would want to see is stacking or bundling of payments rather than the piggybacking where climate change is used as the, 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 the sort of main driver. And with stacking or bundling, you would get paid depending on the, the sort of options that you take up and you would receive payments linked to all of those. Whereas piggybacking, you may only get paid for the carbon work or you may have to choose which biodiversity or carbon will give you more money. So, you know, I think stacking and bundling is potentially a fairer way of doing it and also more transparent uh, for, you know, stakeholders and, and uh, you know, society as a whole to see where, you know, maybe some of their money is going to sort of enhance landscapes and protect biodiversity as well as the sort of climate work. So there's a lot of work that's got to be done before the opportunity can be taken up. Uh, it's not risk free, but, you know, I think the key message as Becky was saying is that there is a huge opportunity for UK agriculture to enter a, a new era where you, you're paid both to sort of lock away carbon but also at the same time to provide clean air, water and enhanced biodiversity. So thank you very much.
Thanks, John, very much. Uh, thanks for stepping in. Uh, thanks, Becky. Um, I'm just conscious of time and we've got so many questions. Now, I just want to give sort of 10 minutes to questions at least. Um, I apologise to everyone. We're going to be a bit late. I did promise that we'd try and um, stop, uh, finish uh, around time, but because of the technical problems, um, I hope you can just bear with us through some of these questions. Now, Becky, I'm just going to give you a bit of a rest just to get your breath back. Uh, I'm going to go to Rob and Andy, really, starting with Rob. Uh, Rob, how did you build the, your organic matter in, in your soils? Um, well, we've been chopping straw for a long time. We're um, importing farm manure. We have been big users of biosolids, um, a bit of compost, um, and now our, our journey with cover crops. I think is bringing something to it. Um, so we're learning all the time about cover crops, where we first started and where we are now. We've got a very different sort of uh, species mix. So I think it's a combination of all factors, really. Um, so, um, but like, like I say, we haven't, you know, we've, we've, as you can see from the results, we've also lost some organic matter in certain situations, which I can't quite understand why that's happened, but there we are. Yeah, Bill. Andy, I know that uh, this is on your radar as well. What's your thoughts on increasing soil organic matter on your farm? Yeah, well, we, we've been, as soon as Rob, we've been um, um, incorporating straw and um, straight back in. No straw has gone off for the last probably 10 years, and we've been min tilling in some description um, for 20 years. So, um, you know, that's definitely helped, got, got us off on the right foot. Uh, and cover crops like Rob for the, probably the last four or five years and sort of finally trying to sort of unpick our way through that journey with cover crops and find out what works for us, what doesn't. But um, yeah, I mean, we've got a long way to go and a lot to learn, but uh, you know, we're, 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 we're making progress. Well, I think I just out of interest, Sorry, um, just out of interest for both of you, um, what uh, are you using? Are you using Dermis or are you using the loss of ignition? Um, just well, I had a chat with Becky about this today, and so yeah, Dumas is sort of what we're looking at, looking at now going forward. Rob, yes, yeah, so I'm I'm lost of ignition, and we we've, we've kept with it just because we've had historic um, historic data to fall back on. So yeah, well, okay, thanks for that, Becky. Uh, hopefully you got your breath back. Uh, question for you: Given both farmers on the webinar have considerable stewardship or woodland activities, what would be the average average score for an average sized farm that has no schemes or natural areas sequestering carbon? Um, it completely depends on sort of uh, you know it's it's a really difficult question because there's no such thing as a, as an average farm. But if you were talking a, a similar sort of farm, um, you could see from those from those graphs at the beginning. Um, if you looked at the average of those of those farms in terms of looking at the, the benchmarking, I think the average emission across those 10 farms was about 345 tonnes emitted rather than sequestered. Um, and that worked out per hectare at I think about two tonnes a hectare. Um, and obviously these guys were down at about minus 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 a half a hectare. Um, I think something that we need to get better at, and, and it's something that research is helping with, is in terms of being able to adequately take account of the sequestration value of different environmental habitats. Um, we've got quite a conservative estimate at the moment, and certainly um, as we look at the different um, the different options that are available through Elms as it comes up and other environmental things, being able to take account. Uh, in a more in a more specific manner um, of the sequestration value of those things uh, will help, uh, you know, and I think will help to start to understand the value of those things, both in terms of their biodiversity value, but also in terms of a carbon a carbon sink. Brilliant. And just leading on from that, you mentioned about Andy uh, Andy's hedge cutting strategy. Uh, one of the questions would is why would cutting a hedge once every two years double the sequestration if you end up with the same size hedge? 
Um, because if you let it grow longer, um, I say there's, there's been some interesting work done. There's three different there's three different layers of sequestration that happens. There's the sequestration that happens if you cut it annually. There's a the sequestration that happens if you cut it every other year. And then there's the sequestration value if you let it grow longer and wider and cut it, for example, every five years. Um, so you're getting that additional growth of biomass, which is pulling in more carbon that you're holding. Um, so that's where you get the differentiation between the different types of management. So, thank you. Um, going back to Rob and Andy, um, I'll go uh, this time straight to Andy. I don't know whether you'll be able to answer this from, but um, someone's asked uh, which crop had the best carbon balance? Is it wheat or seed rape? Uh, or, you know, which is the uh, best uh, balance and which, which is the worst performer? And what about legumes um, that don't use any nitrogen? Andy, yeah, any thoughts? You're right, I probably can't answer that. That's probably a question for Becky actually, isn't it? Um, yeah, I honestly don't know the answer to that. This, uh, Becky, go ahead. No, I was just going to say this is this is the exciting thing that happens when you start carbon footprinting is that this is this is phase two in the fact that now we've got the the headline results. We now start can start to hopefully apportion out the different inputs and stuff to the different crops. So, so, so certainly that is what we can then start to look at once we've done this first bit. We can because what we need to do is start to, um, as I say, apportion out the different inputs and all that sort of things to be able to look at the carbon credentials of different crops. And certainly that enhanced monitoring is very, very exciting. And we shall look at that more uh, hopefully after this, if I haven't uh, put you guys off completely. But that's certainly phase two. Brilliant, thank you. Rob, uh, probably a bit of an easier question um, for you. Um, obviously, uh, concerning your change in drilling strategies, um, have you measured how much carbon is preserved in the soil with direct drilling compared to conventional uh, drilling? No, we haven't. We're, we're very new to this direct drilling. So we're, yeah, we've got, um, it's the first, whether well, we've just done, we just started, you know, this year really primarily mm -hmm. on some, so it's early days, really. Um, I, yeah. Something we need to look at. Yeah, I mean, has, has, our soils are only our soils are only just probably in the window for for direct drilling. If I'm honest. So um, right. I think you know, as if our journey to zero till does work, well then, great. But you know, I think it's too early to say, really. Right. I I, I suppose the carbon audit maybe has uh, whetted your appetite for the future there. To get yeah. those results, yeah. Yeah. Um, a, another one, really, for you, Becky. Are there any auditing systems operational now that are validated? Um, it, it's a really it's a really good question, and it depends in terms of what you what you class as your standards. There are a set of standards that are out there in terms of, a, you know, for carbon footprinting. It's called PASS, uh, it's, it's a PASS standard, um, which sets it sets out the parameters which can be used and which need to be included in part of that standard. Um, there are also various different tools which are used uh, through various supply chains, which allow, you know, allow supply chains to be able to, to demonstrate their carbon credentials. Um, there are there are individual businesses that are starting to look at uh, you know using their carbon carbon performance as a marketing opportunity or are starting to use it to try and add value. Um, in terms of that validation, I think it's certainly something that that we need to start delivering and we need to start developing. I think Paul, you said at the beginning, you know we, we've got sort of fifty six different carbon mm -hmm. calculators. I mean, I think in reality we've probably got about four or five um, that people are using on it. You know, I think originally there was, but I think certainly what we need is we need an update of the of the current past standards because the current past standards were done back in 2011 um, and obviously our science and our understanding has moved on dramatically since 2011 um, and it's a bit like if you think about it you know I, in terms of carbon footprinting it doesn't really matter if you think about it like cars I don't really care which carbon footprinting tool you use you can choose which one works for you but all of your cars have a seatbelt and an MOT and I think that's what we need in terms of we need that level of that level of sort of confidence that that we're getting the same you know we're getting the right figures and that will come and that one of the sort of benefits of having an having an increasing focus on agriculture's carbon credentials at the moment is that hopefully we can now start to build that validation and that verification model around, which means that farmers that want to, uh, you know, want to look for increasing business opportunities or diversification opportunities in terms of marketing those carbon credentials can do so. I think John said at the beginning, we're very much at the beginning of this, of this stage of being able to verify and, and validate um, what's going on. And, and I would um, support what Becky has just said there very strongly. Uh, and we're working with uh, a range of partners 
both in government uh, and within industry, th for example, through the RAP Cool Trial 2025 um, group, to try and get that commonality around the standards and, and you know, robust uh, sort of evidence base. We, we've also got a strand where we're looking at how we can support farmers and growers to use the tools and then once they've used the tools, identify some, you know, really good uh, sort of options that will deliver benefits for them. And we're in the process of developing something called the Evidence for Farming Initiative, and, and that's just the working title for it. We'll have something a bit sexier when we go to launch. But we will be looking to test it with, uh, you know, farmers uh, this month uh, and through April just to see if, you know, for example, min-till, no-till approaches, you know, if you're, you're interested in that, can you get to that information quickly? Um, so we see having robust tools that co farmers have confidence in and, and are happy to use uh, to set that baseline and then tools that help support make those decisions and get to the information quickly being essential. So there's two sides to the equation uh, and we're working away on, on both of those at the moment. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Just one last question, really. That's all we've got time for. Um, and that to probably it's going to go to you, you Becky and John. Um, just want to check, is CO2 still a plant food? The simple answer is yes. Although I've got to say, when I was doing my uh, PhD and postdoc, CO2 levels, the, the sort of background level was 350 parts per million. It's now I think it's up around 450, so it's increased. It's not much further before actually plants adapt to that uh, and it may not have such a big sort of additive uh, benefit. The other thing is for longer term plants, you know, things like trees and hedges and, and so on, they get used to the, the, the CO2 and they stop putting on quite so much uh, mass. Uh, it's called down, down regulation. Um, and so we'll see that. And, and that's also a concern within sort of grassland permanent pasture systems where you might just get saturated with CO2 and the ability to store that carbon. So I, I think, you know, for most of the sort of annual crops that we're growing, we'll, we will see some benefit. But for longer term perennial crops um, and sort of semi-natural vegetation, I think we'll, we'll sort of reach a peak level of carbon and then the system gets leaky depending on how you treat it. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Right, with that, um, I, I'm just conscious of time. I'm really sorry that we haven't got through. There was a lot of questions there um, that we haven't answered. I will share those with the speakers and hopefully um, they, they will pick out and hopefully they, they will answer ones that uh, they feel they haven't got round to. Um, so Christian, um, just want to move on to the next slide, please, because we just need to round off really what's uh, gone on. Uh, keep going. I'll just cycle through to give me two seconds. So, um, just uh, so you know, there should be a slide coming up just with uh, AHDB's free publications. But also, while I'm on that subject, I know that CFE um, have a wide selection of publications with regard to this topic and also uh, using various tools as well. So, you can go onto their website um, and use their information as well. But everything you can see there is free. Um, and available to uh, get download from our website and very relatable to help your business uh, with its carbon footprint and efficiencies. Next slide, please, Christian. Um, as I said, this is, um, as I mentioned, this is the first series of topics we are covering under the banner of Monitor Farm Mondays. Uh, the next one is on the 9th of November at the same time, and we'll be concentrating on the topic of people planning, looking at obtaining the right people for your business in order to help you build resilience and ultimately reach your farm business goals. Further details are on our website, um, so hopefully uh, you'll be able to um, uh, see all the details and link on there if you're interested. Next slide, please, Christian. So finally, I just wanted to recap and on some take home messages. And I'm not going to go through all these. You'll be glad to say. Basically, um, I feel I can sort of condense this. Um, but I would like to highlight that we all know there are some major drivers along, along with challenges ahead for our farming operations. But in in my mind, I think we should consider these challenges as opportunities for our farm and businesses. And this is certainly where carbon audit can assist. 
helping you analyze your operational inputs and outputs, developing best practices that meet regulations and compliances, as well as promoting business efficiency, effectiveness and robustness. And as a bonus, while you're implementing these strategies, you will also be putting your business on the road to becoming net zero carbon farming operation. Next slide, please, Christian. So with these thoughts, I would like to thank tonight's speakers, Becky, Rob, Andy, and John. Becky, thank you for bearing with it. I'm sorry you had those technical uh, hitches. Um, but uh, thank you for, to all our speakers. Thanks, John, as well, for stepping in a bit earlier than usual as well, and to our, uh, both our farmers as well. And also, lastly, but no means least, and I'm sure he's um, probably lost a few pounds and gone a bit bolder, um, Christian, who has done an excellent job in the background, sorting out the technical side and getting things finally to tick along nicely. And by no means least, all of you as listeners, uh, thank you for your patience tonight and for listening and participating uh, with your questions. Um, until the next time we meet, good night and keep safe.